and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet. Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast, produced by Bob and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet, in our opinion, of course. I'm Brad Heineck, and I'm exactly one half of the Bob and Brad team, and today we're joined with Chris, the pharmacist, who we're extremely excited to have on. He is one of the smartest pharmacists there is. I think he should be a doctor, actually, because he no. really cares about people. <laughs> and he does excessive research on these topics, and it's all updated. So we're happy to have him. And we're today, the, the uh, name of the video, the topic is Control Your Asthma with the Best At-Home Treatment to Stay Active and Reduce Your Medication Intake. So, Chris... Should we carry on with this? I think so. I'm excited about this because I've had a, a number of patients with asthma, but as far as the details of it, I'm a little ignorant of it. So this is good for me as sure. well. Uh, number one, let's just briefly describe asthma. I know if you have it, you know, but there's some people, family members that may not know some of the details, but I don't want to get too much into the sure. detail and go, get, get to the treatment. Yeah. I mean, asthma basically is airway inflammation. And you can just think of your lungs as kind of a, you know, got a couple of lungs right here yep. and then you got a tube that kind of leads to them and they split off and they go into each lung. And when you listen to somebody that complains about asthma, it's kind of like they, you tell them to go out jogging and just breathe through a straw. And that's what an asthmatic attack feels like. And what asthma truly is, by definition, is airway inflammation. And so what happens is, is that the airways, think of it as just kind of a giant straw, yeah. gets swollen. And also it gets excessive amounts of mucus in there. Mm. And so it clogs it up and you just can't get air going in there. And what's natural, like if we're going up a flight of stairs or if we're exercising to one level or another, the airway is narrow to force air into the lungs to connect to the blood, you know, to get into your bloodstream, to give oxygen to your body so you can supply it to the muscles. So these airways are... are inflamed we're getting swollen up so the, the passages are smaller correct and then we exercise and we need more air and so, so yeah so the natural progression is it does yeah. and so and and your body thinks well oh my god and, you know asthma is caused by triggers so it can be you know you can have allergens so things like dust or pollen okay. those types of things Cat dander, dog dander, you know, just... These are the common... Mold. Things. Yeah, these are all triggers. Air okay. pollution. Um, so if you have... Cold air. Cold air is a trigger, but that works a little bit differently, but it's still a trigger. And it, what about exercise-induced exercise asthma? Exercise-induced asthma is actually brought on. And again, you know, kind of like with that example, we're walking up the stairs and our bodies need a little bit more oxygen to supply to the sure. muscles. Well, when we begin to exercise, whether we're lifting weights or, you know, most people maybe hit the treadmill or ride a bike, mm -hmm. you know, the heart rate gets up and, you know, the demands for oxygen in our body, we need it. So the natural progression is, is those airways are going to naturally narrow to try and force oxygen into the lungs sure. to get that exchange. Well, when we have asthma, and particularly exercise-induced asthma, uh, or what they actually call it now is exercise-induced bronchiospasm is the new label. So they call okay. it EIB. So the, the, None, the nonetheless, report, yeah. um, that said, it helps us to breathe better. But when we have this condition, we don't. And so all of a sudden the airways are reactive. They narrow. It starts to produce mucus because it thinks it's helping to lubricate it. It thinks it's a good thing. Hey, we're going to force air in the lungs, but all of a sudden it overproduces the mucus. The airways keep shrinking and all of a sudden, mm. wow, you can't breathe. So it's a very uncomfortable situation. It's a very uncomfortable situation that, you know, really happens between five and 20 minutes uh, into the ex sure. exercise that they're participating in. And who... Like what percentage? You have any idea of how many people have asthma? I say in the United States. Well, it's a it's it's large. I mean, you can there's millions and millions of people that have asthma. Sure. So it's not a simple answer because you have people that have asthma, you have people with exercise induced you know conditions. Mm. So different. it's it, it's different categories for different people. Right. And then okay. you can go into other lung conditions like COPD. You can go into emphysema. So they're all somewhat intertwined, even though they're very much they're different all... disease states. But you still Still can't breathe. Right. Yeah. And that's the simplest way to Anything look at in it. particular that causes asthma or people born with it? Well, you know, that's funny. The scientists really don't have a solid answer. We just it's there's probably a genetic component to it. Mm -hmm. So if you know family members and, and relatives have had it, you know, there's a good chance that you will. And we sure. see that regularly when I see families coming to my pharmacy. I mean, we've had people that we just say they're the asthma family. Um, <laughs> and I'm not kidding. Yeah. You'll, you'll see with them all come out with a bag full of inhalers. Um, so it's you know, it's a very manageable disease state, but it's incurable. 
Um, so we no, no cure, no cure. So and then the best way that we do it is to manage it with medications. So you're going to have your rescue inhalers and you have your maintenance inhalers. And we also use oral medications, uh, particularly to the, each situation that's needed. But isn't there like pretty high level athletes that have asthma? Oh yeah. And yeah. So you can deal. Yeah. With you it. can deal with it. I mean, the, the American, uh, lung association, they have a listing of exercise. They say is better. They tell people that if you have asthma, they want you to work out and exercise because it strengthens the lung muscles sure. to help you to breathe better. So the last thing on earth you want to do is be sedentary when you have asthma. Okay. Right. Um, and so you would use inhalers and medication therapy that you would have planned with your doctor right. to allow you to enjoy your day to day activities. You know, a lot of times too, with asthma, you just have to know to pace yourself. Um, so that's the one thing is, you know, but there's, list, like I said, burst sports. So football, baseball, downhill skiing, you know, versus, say, running, triathlons, cross-country skiing, ice hockey, soccer. Those things are a little bit tougher on the asthmatic, but there's no reason on earth why you can't do them. Okay. Uh, let's look at Paula Radcliffe. She's the women's uh, world record holder in the marathon. In 2015, she just blew it out of the water. She grew up as an asthmatic, and she didn't look at it as a weakness at all. She said, if anything, it made me stronger. Oh. So... Tough gal. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> and she's not the look, only one. Look her up. One. No, yeah. there no, there are tons. You can go across the sport. My both my kids had exercise induced. So I mean it's I mean it's yeah. and they both and then, play hockey. Right. So as well as other, you know, your son's a tri sport. Yeah. yeah so he plays school. everything and you know, he, he grew out of it. Most kids do. So that's kind oh, of they the, do. Yeah. I mean it's a lot it's kind of a sidebar, but it's certainly something that I mean, if we want to break down asthma, we could probably do a full on video. I mean, I think we're working more with the bronchospasm peak yep. flow meters, yep. but well, as you get older, in general, does asthma get worse, stay the same, or depends on how you manage it? It depends on how you manage it. So, I mean, so the key what is, we have here is, is going to be we, we've got a device here that we're going to talk about in detail. Yep, peak flow meter. Yep. Um, anything else as far as diet or anything of that nature? Does that influence it? No, I mean, I, there's not really. I mean, it's going to be external influences. I mean, cold air can cause bronchospasm mm -hmm. because when we breathe dry, cold air, um, our lungs don't like it. We like warm moist air. Sure. So when we breathe, like what we've dealt with recently with this really sub cold, you know, subarctic weather. Yeah, we're, we're, we're in Wisconsin, Minnesota. It's been 20 below. In the, at so, night. yeah. And so when you get hit with that kind of stimulation, your lungs don't dig that at all. So they immediately <laughs> constrict yeah. to try and keep warm air in there. Even with healthy lungs. Yeah, yeah. even with healthy lungs. Mm -hmm. But, I, and that's why sometimes when you go outside, all of a sudden you get a quick cough and it's because your lungs aren't happy with that. And so, you know, sure. kind of, they want to keep it warm. So if you have an asthmatic, uh, it's going to be a, uh, even more hyperreactive situation where, you know, so if you know this is going to be the case and let's say you have to walk to a bus stop or the store or up the corner, you probably should use a rescue inhaler probably 15 minutes before you go outside to protect against that bronchiospasm. So you're talking about the medicine that you, yep. you uh, breathe yep. in. Yep, albuterol or leave albuterol. Sure. Yep. Yeah, I, I remember uh, teaching karate. I had students that would have that and they'd keep it right there in the room. Oh yeah. Yeah. As long as you use it about 15 minutes prior to activity, it's, it's going to take care of business. And it's going to ensure that you can have an enjoyable time. And, you know, just like anybody, you know, when you have an exercise induced bronchospasm or cold air induced bronchospasm, I mean, as long as you're prepared for it and we manage it, we pace ourselves when we warm up. Yep. I mean, it is a very livable disease. Oh. Um, but nonetheless, to circle back to your initial question, it's not curable. It's forever. And, yep. and it's all about disease state management. So uh, let's get to that. How, how do you manage it? And I know we talked about this prior, uh, and you talked about a device like this yep, peak flow can, meter. can really make a difference on someone's management and exactly. to be able to do what they want, be active. But at the same time, you said it's not very well promoted by doctors, at least in your experience. In my experience, I think this is probably the under, most underused you know, tool in the shed. These things are cool. Uh, basically what these are is just a little meter and it allows you to see ranges of what your forced expiratory volume is. And most pulmonologists, when they get down to the nitty gritty, they're going to have you come in and use a spirometer, which is a very much more specific version of sure. this, where they're going to give you a really precise measurement. Yeah. And so, but this, anybody can do at home. You can buy it right off the shelf. You can buy it online. Uh, I think this was at the pharmacy where I got. Right. So, it was, I mean, it was $22. Yeah. So not horrible. Expensive, and that but comes with a box. Too. Comes with a box and has chart and instructions, the whole nine yeah, yards. You bet. But basically, all people want to do, you want to make sure it's clean each time. Can I? Can I do it? Because yeah. I've already practiced with that. Yep. At home. I don't so, want you to. Get... Nope, that's fine. So yeah, you want to just either sitting with good posture, standing is probably most ideal. But you want to do is breathe in and then put your lips tight, 
tight seal and then blow out as hard as you can. So we're going to look fast and as hard so as you can. So if I'm feeling good, we're going to get a baseline of what our lungs can exhale. Yep. And, and what doctors want people to do with their asthma action plan when they use these is you want to do a course of numbers that's taken probably twice a day over the course of about two to three weeks. And you're going to go with that highest number you get. And we'll talk about the zones in a okay. minute. Yeah. Because I think in here I was reading it said to do it three times. Yep. Take the highest one. Yep. Okay. So and I did this. I was actually in my recliner and I blew on it. I looked at my age group and it's like, I'm really low. I can't be. Yeah, I'm, I'm healthy. And then I realized that was my posture. Yeah. I posture is huge. Yeah. So and actually when people are having responses, we want them to be sitting upright if they can because you can get more air into your get, lungs. Yeah. And you want to relax and slow your breathing. But that's you know, a different discussion. Bob and I but, talk about posture all the time with shoulders, with uh, spine, you know, uh, problems. And here... Posture with breathing is, you know, it's, it is. And here's proof in the pudding. Should I try this one? Yeah, yeah. Give it a whirl. Okay, Either so, sit upright or, so or stand. Yep. Get as much in as yeah, possible. Yeah, you want to take a deep breath, and then you want to lock it and blow as hard as you can. Go. <laughs> okay. And that's a wow. common response, guys. It, it will. That's okay. Uh, yeah, it's okay. I didn't okay. Do it too hard. No, because you no, you want to blow as hard as you can. And and actually, somebody with asthma probably will have a little bit of coughing afterwards. Okay. Ideally, you want to do it before you use your daily inhalers because it'll kind of give you a baseline, ah. so you know really where you stand. Um, and then you can actually do it. And some doctors will actually recommend where you are after your inhalers, so you kind of have an idea of what each one is. Right. But I would tell you, it's best. The best values you're going to get is before your inhaler, and so you'd want to do it in the morning. And then again in the evening, and you know your peak flow values are going to value. You're going to up and down throughout yeah. the day too. So, so this is pretty close to where I was at home. I'm about 625 or so. And when I was sitting, I was down to about 450, yep. and I was slouched a little bit because of the recliner. Yep. And, and then I I did this, and, and I, I like was another, just about another the same. two. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing what the difference is. So we should do three of those in a row. We don't have to yep. do it now, but nope. if you're using it three in a row, and then pick the highest number. Yep. And so, can you, can you see that, Liz? We'll kind of zoom in. We'll kind of put that up. Now so. we've got a. This is a pretty uh, technical chart here. Oh pretty yes, <laughs> my artwork at its finest. The way that they calculate out the green zone is where we all strive to be. So if your medications are working well and you're feeling good, when you have an asthma plan written with your doctor, this is where you want to be. And that's going to be. You, yep. you can figure that out on there, and there's yep. a little and we're gonna marker. Yeah, so we're going to pretend that that 650 is where Brad is, and then we want to go basically 20 percent less of that. And so it's so rough. you do a little math. To yeah, get you that. do a little bit of math. You can use a calculator. And what's really kind of cool about most of these, actually, if you guys have smartphones, yep. you can go right online and you can download it to your smartphone. Or a lot of these will have a chart for you. So yeah, for old school like me, that probably use yep, paper but, chart. But they all work. But basically, this is the goal. So if your maintenance medications are working well and your rescue inhalers are working well, this is where we want to be all the time if we can be. So you do your three breaths, look yep. at the chart, and if you're in there, it's good. Yep. But then... Let's say, you know, oftentimes, and what's so cool about using peak flow meters to actually see how your breathing is doing is oftentimes there are subtle signs that you don't even feel yourself. And all of a sudden you're like, you, you blow on it when subtle you get up. Subtle signs of? Just you're, you can't feel that your breathing is diminished. You okay. still think you're in the green zone. And you're like, man, I just blew a yellow. Uh, so and, and so now we're down here. So instead also, of like me being 625, I might be down in the yeah, 500. Yeah, so yeah, this all of a sudden you're like 400, and, you know, 490 or something like that. And, also, and so I you're feel the, fine. But you feel fine. So when we use this on a daily basis, it's a tool. And a lot of times doctors and pulmonologists will give people written plans as to how do we adjust our medications accordingly so we can get back up here. We yep. want to live up here. This is, this is our home. This is our happy place. So when we get here, and particularly when we get to the red zone, this is a medical attention immediately. So there should be when you go to the doctor or you go to the or you go to the ER. Yeah. So when you get to the red zone, that means your rescue inhaler is not working. Uh, relax, just anything that you know, you're using your maintenance medications, things just aren't working well. Sure. This is go to the emergency department or you know, call your doctor and say, hey, what do you want me to do? Sure. Sometimes they'll have standing orders at pharmacies. They might tell you to use a nebulizer, which is another type of medication. Sure. But, but at the end of the day, this is crisis zone. This is the last place we want to be. Okay. And when we are not paying attention to our asthma levels, um, you know, this is where the chronic damage can come in, where you can ah. lose lung functioning permanently. Oh, so cool. asthma management oh, yeah. is a huge thing and this is a wonderful wonderful tool and it's cheap it's easy it, to use for yeah and you can use it they last if you take care of it you just clean it after you use it with yeah. warm soapy water let sure. it dry out um, and actually you want to make sure that you clean it because mucus and just little particles of just you know the exhaust of us breathing exhaling yep, sure. will clog it and may actually 
not get the best possible yep. answer. So keep it clean. Take I, care I of it. I saw they had instructions on cleaning. Yep. Um, so when you get in that yellow zone, you might feel normal, but then that's when you're going to you take can. your inhaler. Yeah. So a lot of times what doctors will do, you have rescue inhalers and you have maintenance inhalers. And sometimes doctors will have a specific plan where you might have a lower dose oral inhaled steroid. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, oh, we're creeping into yellow. We're going to raise that dose. And all of a sudden, you go to the next highest strength. And so that allows them to hopefully get themselves back. You know, we calm down the inflammation, but if we get a full-blown asthma yeah. attack, we get ourselves back into the green zone. And it may take a couple of weeks of using your medication okay. consistently to get to that point. Uh, there's also treatments that doctors will do specifically where they'll put you on oral steroids to really try and drive the bus sure. and get a quicker response. Because yep. like I said, we do not want to live in this zone because this actually can be very detrimental to our long-term health and well sure, sure. So as far as medications that your doctor, the inhalers and things, is there any uh, information that you think people should know, any precautions or go to? Well, things? actually, yeah. I mean, proper use of an inhaler is huge. So, I mean, it's it's one of those things where particularly, let's say you have a child patient. Um, a lot of times they can't necessarily, I wish I brought an inhaler with me, um, but they can't necessarily get the timing of the puff. So there's a, oh. a little plastic tube called a spacer that looks kind of similar to this, but it's fully round and allows for, if you have a child that's like, say, three or four years old and they're an asthmatic, they can't just normally hold it one inch from their face, time the puff and inhale it, even with parental guidance. Right. So basically it's got a mask that covers their mouth and their nose and then it allows them to get a full puff with their rescue inhaler and or their maintenance inhalers. So it really allows them to deposit that medication into the lung tissue where it needs to be sure. to help to reduce the inflammation and help them to breathe more comfortably and more effectively. So if you're just getting into this medication, even if you're an adult, it seems like you have to kind of practice and learn how yeah, to Yeah, I think it is a learned skill set. It doesn't take terribly long, but you know, people with arthritic hands, I mean, you know, it's just, there's little tips that mm. we'll tell you as a pharmacist, maybe you need to use both hands to try and help even though it's it's just a little sprayer, but and, and most people can compress it with just a sure. couple of fingers, yep. but you know, arthritis, age, sure. coordination, I mean, you know, I've had people spray themselves in the eye by mistake Ooh. on their first time. You're just not used to spraying yep. something, you know. And in the old days, you know, they've changed the propellant because we want to make things better in the environment. So they've got a softer spray now, which actually is better for patients because ah. you can hold it about an inch from your mouth and then inhale it and deposit it in your lungs quite effectively. Okay. In the old days, we used to have you put it right in your mouth, but a lot of times it would spray the roof of your mouth and you would, you'd swallow more than you'd deposit it into oh, your lungs. Sure, so sure. there is an effective technique for actually providing okay. that as well. Wow. So, you know, I'm thinking about this and, you know, there, there, once you learn how to deal with this, but it amazes me how, a marathon runner with this obviously must be in the green most of the time. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's, for those people that want to be active, that's good news. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, work no. with this. And, boy, it seems like using it this could it's, really be a, it's, it's a game changer. changer it, right? it is a game changer. And, it, you know, I'd like it, it's a nice tool that I think is underutilized. And it's something that I really think can be life-changing for people. So they stay healthy forever, as yeah. long as they possibly can. Yep. And you know, like I said, we want to stay out of these two zones. We want to stay up here. Yep. And, and this is a tool that will help you to at least take your medications appropriately and effectively with your doctor's plan. And that's critical. Especially with that app, especially if people are really comfortable with, yeah. with you know, cell the phones. Maybe some of the older people not. But I'm amazed at some people that are in their 70s and 80s and they're, oh, they they're, got their phones they're out. They're sharp as tacks. I mean, I a lot of times, too, people seem to get intimidated by technology, but it, it's really there to help make things sure. easier. And with the smartphones and the apps that we have today, it's just nice to have at a moment's notice. You get up, you do, you, you plug in your values, and you're like, all right, I'm green. I'm good to go. I'm going hiking today. We're going to Hicks. And then there's probably history in there. So when you see your doctor, you can, you say, can show them it the, very quickly. Very and Excellent. Yep. Yeah. It's an excellent tool for the doctor. You know, the other thing too, when you go to see your doctor, you know, bring your meds with you yeah. so they can see what you're doing. Even they can actually, Hey, I want to see how your technique, how are you doing with your inhaler? Yeah. So they can make sure that they see it effectively sure. and make sure that it looks like you're getting yeah. an effective dose. So it's always a good little tip to work with. I mean, your physicians are there to help you. I want you to take advantage of that at all costs, because at the end of the day, if we get you out there staying healthy and exercising, it's really one of the most important things we can do. All right, man. I, I'm feeling pretty pumped up about this, Chris. This is, uh, you know, if I happen to have a family member that has this, or you know, I feel a lot more knowledgeable and uh, optimistic about it. Yeah, I mean, it really is. Like I said, it's it's unfortunate we don't have a cure. We just we just don't know how. We don't really yeah. even know why or how it's caused or how it comes. Other than that, there's a genetic link, yep. and that you know we have, you can't breathe. So we have tools with special inhalers, maintenance inhalers, and certain oral medications that we utilize 
to try and help to keep all this into a package so we can keep people living in that green zone. Now, this is you're at the end of the video here, and I just just a personal thing. Can people scuba dive that are asthmatic? Yeah. So, I mean, they just have to make sure they're in their green zone. But, yeah, yeah I mean, it's it's certainly something that I, I do know that with dry, dive instructors, I think it's certainly a warning and things yeah. that they watch out for. So <laughs> I'd work with you. The first thing you do before you just go off on like a, a weekend where you, you know, go to Florida or you go down to the Caymans or something crazy like that, talk to your doctor first. Yeah. Make sure that you are cleared to do things like that because there are certain things that can go on below water, as you know, as a scuba diver. Yeah. It could be detrimental. Oh, and that's, yeah. that's the last thing. Feet I mean, under and and you got to uh, go, or maybe you're going deeper and then you get, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. Make I, sure you're cleared by your doctor <laughs> to make sure that it's an activity that you can you do. you can't puff underwater. No, it's it's going to be, yeah, you're not going to be able to take your inhaler with you. Yeah. So it's just, it's oh. something that you're going to want to make sure that you have a plan specifically for that trip. Make sure you're you're in a good zone. Because I'll tell you what, if you're in yellow or red, you you're don't want to be going. going no, you do yeah. not go in. Uh, sure. All right. Well, I feel good about this. And, uh. I think we'll sign off with this and good luck with everything. And, uh, I, you know, if you want to get one of these, I think it's. Uh, yeah. It, any, it, any pharmacy or right online. Great way to get them, guys. Yep. It'll certainly right. help you out. Take care and uh, Thank good you. luck. Have a good day.